united the beauties, that is, the beauties that have lost their right hand, I see the opposite effect. So they, they tend to say that the targets that were placed to their left side are further away. So, so um, this would mean that the side of the amputation, the left side compared to the right side, would bias them to actually report as if visual information on this side is shrunk, which is in accordance to the hypothesis that I raised. We've repeated the same experiment with the same subjects, but now we place the amputees well away from the screen. So they're sitting 150 centimeters from the screen. So, sorry, uh, in this task, everything is completely identical to the previous task we have shown you. The only difference is the physical distance between the subject and the screen. So the targets are now outside of action space. And what we found was that when the same task was performed in far space, there were no differences in the performance between people that had lost their right hand and left hand. And in fact, both amputees were performed more, more accurately. So this result shows us that we can find some distortions in visual perception following amputation, but they are specific to near space, to actual space. So uh, this experiment, as I mentioned before, is behavioral. I, I asked them to uh, gener generate some um, um, responses to uh, stimuli that I'm presenting to them. But uh, we can think how this result might relate to changes in the brain that amputees face following amputation. So what does happen in the brains of amputees after the amputation? Um, to answer that, I first have to talk about what happens in the brains of people that are not lost their hands. And one very well established principle in the brain that we find is that of the homunculus that David just uh, uh, mentioned before. So, if we look at the parts of the brain that are in charge of um, feeling touch of their body or moving different body parts, we find that there's a very nice organization within it. <coughs> the different parts of the brain are represented in different, sorry, different parts of the body are represented in different bits of the brain. So if I go along the real bits of brain, a good friend. So, um, if I would look here along the brain, I would see that just in the middle between the two hemispheres, we have areas that are responsible in rep to represent the feet. After that, you have uh, the, um, the legs, the trunk. Uh, after that, you would have the arm, the hands, and finally the face and mouth. So this organization makes our life much easier as neuroscientists, because we could actually generate very strong predictions about what a particular brain area should be doing. So in effect, we have this map of the brain. If you give me coordinates about a certain bit of the brain, I could probably tell you which brain area should be represented there, in the same way that if I give you GPS coordinates, you can tell me uh, where I am in Oxford. So now we can ask, what would happen to the area that is responsible for the hand following amputation? And this is an interesting question because the brain cells in this area are used to getting information that is associated with the hand. So unlike maybe our intuition that these areas would just become unemployed, retired, start gardening, mm -hmm. it turns out that these areas are actually being recruited by different bits of the brain. So that if the neurons here don't get any input, they don't have what to do, then neighboring areas, for example, from the face and for the arms, might try to invade these areas and conquer them. And um, from um, studies in, in uh, animals, we know that there's this brutal fight that might be happening between the different bits of the brain around the head area to take over as many brain cells as possible. It has been suggested that in humans, this battle could be causing phantom pain. And I want to show you one of the main studies that suggested this argument.